COVID-19 has claimed the lives of more than 500,000 Americans, and it's taken the humanity of countless more. I've been lucky to be spared the grip of this virus, but I've been equated with one myself. I've been Asian and American my whole life, but I was born in and adopted from Taiwan. And it wasn't until this pandemic that I began to feel so far away from the country of my birth and as if I'd lived my whole life in a country that promised me a dream, but a promise it couldn't keep. Mm. I've met my family in my hometown of Taipei, my birth mother, who was 16 when she had me. And in Taiwan, we look Chinese, we speak Chinese, I don't. We aren't Chinese, but we have a unique place in this country's history, just like people from everywhere else. And yet we're all thrown into this pan-ethnic label. Asian American, a catch-all for half of the world's population. But for my whole life as an adoptee, adopted by wonderful Chinese American parents who look like me, I've lived in San Francisco, California. And I would sit on the roof of my house, look west, past the Golden Gate Bridge, towards the setting sun, and it was a crushing reminder of how far away Taiwan was, literally beyond the horizon beyond the beginning of the night and where the darkness begins. So I don't see horizons as something hopeful. Rather, to me, a horizon is an orientation, not a destination. Anti-racism, racism, they're kind of like sunsets. You can't ever be at a sunset. You can't touch it, but it touches you. We still paint them. We take pictures of them, seriously, millions of pictures of them, because they do something to us. They make us feel a certain way. But you can't touch racism. Racism touches every single one of us every single day. And an orientation is something to be pointed towards, which of course isn't a bad thing at all. But it's when we mistake an orientation for a destination when, that we are convinced that we have already reached a post-racial America where racism no longer exists. Look, in San Francisco, I spoke more Spanish than any other language except English. I remember all the times I refused to go to Chinese school. Hell, I even hated Chinese food that didn't come from Panda Express. And my school sat atop a hill from which you could literally look down upon Angel Island where my ancestors were first hidden away from the rest of America and Chinatown where we were told we could never leave. Being an adoptee made me a pessimist growing up because I rarely felt as if I belonged or fit in, even though I'm about as American as it gets. I played varsity baseball in high school, sadly. I have a degree in political science. And I teach teachers how to teach U.S. history. But I'm not here to convince you that I'm American. I am here to tell you that I'm trying to live up to a single standard of what it means to be American is a pursuit of happiness. Like the American dream itself. That too many of us as people of color will never reach. A lot of what we are probably heard about anti-racism and social justice has been in pursuit of survival keeping us alive. But what about thrival? Our joys, our happiness, which go beyond the portrayals of pain and suffering in the news media and the stigmatization of mental health. Part of it comes from how we become racialized. It made into an other as Asian Americans, be it the way we look, the languages we speak, or the countries we're from. And yet, many people of color living in this country, like me, have almost no connection to where we're really from. And I'm not alone in saying that America doesn't really feel like home when we're told to go back to places many of us have never been. The Asian community has been under attack for the past year. Assaults on people I've never met but whose pain, I feel as if it were my own. They're the same age as my parents, and I as an eight-year-old experienced what it's like 
to see an Asian American person bleed to death on the pavement in front of me. That individual lost his life after he T-boned my father's car. His blood soaking a pack of baseball cards I clenched in my hands as I uttered the F word for the first time in my life. Now fast forward to a few weeks ago when news alerts about a mass shooting in Georgia lit up my phone, the image of that Asian American person's lifeless body flashed before me. The difference is that he died by accident, but the eight victims were murdered in a racist hate crime because a white gunman was having a bad day. The racist stereotypes of being a model minority, the correct way to be a person of color or a forever foreigner, show me that we need to challenge the assumption that there is a single Asian American experience. And I'm here to offer some advice on how educators and those who care about children can be part of this fight. And I'm not here to tell you some rosy picture about how it's all gonna be okay. I'm a pessimist because justice has been denied too many people of color murdered by police, mass shooters, and white supremacist vigilantes. But I'm also a pessimist in a hopeful profession. Now my students, our future social studies teachers, teaching and teacher education, this thing I do, are hopeful acts. Teaching is a forward-looking profession. It's where our hopes and dreams for our communities can become reality. And at teaching's core it is a fundamental belief that our students' strengths, their passions, identities, will imagine a better and brighter future for communities all across this country. And if you want proof, ask my students who are starting their careers as social studies teachers in schools across Michigan during a global pandemic who are still hopeful because they know the impact that they have on their students. And I tell my students that I see myself as a pessimist in a hopeful profession because I'm painfully aware that I am teaching my students to work with a curriculum that I do not see myself represented in. So I don't see horizons as something hopeful. But they're kind of like my home country of Taiwan because to, to me, Taiwan is somewhere that feels far away, somewhere that I can maybe aspire to return to someday, somewhere that will always be home to me, but it'll always be an idea. And I'm giving this talk at a time of intense anti-Asian racism and xenophobia re-emerging because of a pandemic that the previous occupant of the White House called the Chinese virus or the Kung flu. Or again, just weeks ago when six Asian American women were murdered by a white supremacist mass shooter in Georgia. But I said I'm in a hopeful profession, which means I and my colleagues believe our work can do something about the violence our kids of color encounter at school and beyond. But it is not just on us as teachers and teacher educators to orient our students towards normalizing counter-narrative storytelling and fighting the racialization of folks of color. We cannot keep mistaking an orientation of anti-racism or even our loftiest ideals like the American dream for a destination. When kids, especially those of us who come to America like me and are taught to be American in social studies classrooms, we learn white middle class norms and are set up for disappointment when we realize that years later that the American dream is, as David Lavery reminds us, a frail hope rather than a firm promise. And Gloria Latson Billings and William Tate point out that so many folks of color feel that we have to self-condemn our identities in order to self-preserve. I think often about the times I had to distance myself to self-condemn my race, my culture, in order to preserve myself. And in that way, this horizon of a post-racial America, after we've had a black president and now a black woman vice president, is still an orientation, not a destination. And I say that again because we need to disrupt the curriculum we teach our kids and challenge those in power who profit from what we continue to teach our kids. 
And in our community's classrooms, well-meaning teachers unintentionally cause kids to be ashamed of their identities and histories, or just as problematically taught to see that their culture as a, is a set of stereotypes, food, and festivals, which means that we need to rethink what representation and solidarity look like in our classrooms and how we train our community's teachers. Maybe then the things that made me feel like an outsider as a kid will become an entry point into another student's happiness. Now with survival and anti-racism as an orientation and our students' and children's joys the destination, here are three steps towards centering that happiness of our kids and the kids in our communities as an anti-racist practice with links that you can scan while you watch, by the way. So, one, Black Lives Matter at school is an organization of teachers who make four demands. One, that, we, that schools fund counselors, not cops. Two, hire more black teachers and teachers of color. Three, teaching black history and ethnic studies every month and four, ending zero tolerance policies. Because when black lives matter, we are all lifted up. Two, I want you to be intentional about the books you pick for your kids. It's not just our elementary school teacher's responsibility to choose books for our kids to read. There are organizations advancing Asian American representation in children's libraries in our curriculum. One in particular that you can support right now is the Association of Chinese Teachers, who has worked since the 1960s to combat racism against all Asian Americans in schools. This is an organization you can support with your dollars and help them bring their lesson plans and resources to classrooms all over this country. Three, if you see something, say something. And I don't mean to police or surveil folks of color but to report incidents you see of violence against Asian Americans by going to stopaapihate.org. And if you see something right now, stop watching, scan this code, and add to our national database that will inform future civil rights legislation. Because honestly, resistance is not a luxury of convenience, but a necessity of survival. And we need to do better. Because a black square on Instagram isn't resistance, it's safe. It's not like showing up to a protest or risking your safety and privilege for someone you don't even know. And it, because look, again, anti-racism, it's like a sunset. It's a horizon, it's an orientation. It cannot be a destination unless we start over with some of the very structures of our schools and country. Because right now, the spiritual, emotional, and physical survival of students of color in this country is the orientation. But our joys and our happiness in school needs to be the destination. We are not there. We will make mistakes, but we need to be in this work together for the long game. From a pessimist in a hopeful profession, take it from me, we must Dream big, fight hard, get into a little good trouble, but also look inward to unlearn the assumptions, biases, and stereotypes that cause our children in our communities to self-condemn in order to self-preserve our psyche and our spirit. And maybe, maybe then, we're going to take a few steps towards our destination. Thank you.